But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you for the second part of this message, Lord, worshipping, worshipping through the generation gap in the grain, we thank you for just leading us into your worship through the praise, as well as the thanksgiving and the faithfulness of you, O Lord, learning the accounts of David, the King of Israel, as well as even further back when it spoke of how they journeyed through the wilderness. Lord, as the children of Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel, got to be, we ask that through that wrestling with you and just honouring your holy name in the process, you give us that new heart, the new mind and the new spirit that will allow us to know that we are contending for the advancement of the kingdom. And we thank you for this message and we hope and pray that your name will be exalted and magnified, giving us the future and the hope that you promised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in the first part of this message, we spoke about the different points that I've just prayed into, which was speaking about the praises to the Lord for his holiness, a song of praise for the Lord's faithfulness to his people, and also David and how he's made king over Israel and the growth of the army of God, and his uh, songs of thanksgiving. But also appreciating that um, there was an itinerary that showed Israel's passing from what could have been 11 days. It took many years. But appreciating the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The covenant, the oath and the statute. The everlasting covenant. For a thousand generations when we come back into relationship with him. Through the historical accounts and experiences that we closed off after talking about the children of Jacob. And when we appreciate the wonders and the awe of our Lord God Almighty, it gives us the opportunity to appreciate that we can be set free. We close the last message off on that um, Genesis chapter 39 verses 21, but we're going to open the second part of this message on a great kingdom dynamic, which is the lessons for dreamers from the life of Joseph. Joseph held to the vision God gave him for his life. It kept him through everything he experienced. He was restrained from sin, redeemed from sorrow, and restored to honour by holding on to the dreams from God. But here are five guidelines we learn from Joseph. Number one, we need to receive God's promises with childlike faith. Number two, we need to make the best of a bad situation. Number three, to stand with integrity in trials and temptations. And number four, to walk in humility before God and man. But number five, to see everything in life from God's perspective. You know, Joseph was accused. He was ridiculed. He was almost killed. He was captured, put into slavery. He had integrity, when he said, no, I'm not going to take the advances of Pharaoh's wife. And also how these prophetic dreams and visions that he held on to caused the turnaround, even for his own family. But he, there were five things we've got to, that we can learn. We've got to receive God's promises with that childlike faith. And we've got to make the best of a bad situation. And we've got to stand with integrity in trials and temptations. And also to walk in humility before God and man. And to see everything from God's perspective. Someone said there's always two sides of a, a coin. But when we stand with Christ, we are standing on the third side. We're not going against the second realm of um, accusing, pointing fingers, betraying, hatred. We're looking at it from God's point of view, going, Lord, show me what you're saying during this season, even if it's an accusation falsely, as Joseph had, or perhaps maybe a betrayal like he had. 
and how God redemptively, through another example of uh, the lessons of all those in the, in the scriptures, redeemed the situation because he was personal. Joseph, the son of the patriarch Jacob, was born in Sharon, Mesopotamia, on the 1st of Tammuz, uh, Tam, in 1562 BC. He was the first child of Jacob's most beloved wife, Rachel. And born after seven childless years of marriage, she was barren. We spoke of in the last message how Leah and her womb was open and how she went through that process of thinking that she was unloved to thinking that her husband would love her, to realizing that God would be her, her ultimate lover. But Joseph passed away on the same date, 110 years later, in Egypt. When Joseph was six years old, Jacob and his family returned to the Holy Land, eventually settling in Hebron. Younger than 10 of his 11 brothers, he was his father's favorite caused great rivalry that existed between him and his siblings. The animosity towards Joseph increased when he related two dreams he had concerning his uh, destiny and his future. As mentioned, he was sold into slavery, taken to Egypt, imprisoned when refusing the advances of his master's wife. But after interpreting the pair of mysterious dreams dreamt by Pharaoh, he was appointed vicar over Egypt to oversee the gathering of the grain, as well as the storage of it. That was in preparation for the seven years of famine that Pharaoh's dream had predicted. Remember the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows? Even having two children with Asnat, Manasseh and Ephraim, the great famine brought his brothers to Egypt to purchase grain. And through the accounts of historical experiences, we learn so much about this account of God's restoration through that captivity, the betrayal, even the attempted murder. A series of traits and tests to see the loyalty to each other and the remorse over which they had done to Joseph had caused a reconciliation with them when he revealed himself to, to them. But furthermore, he went to settle his father and the entire family, 70 souls in all, in Egypt. But Joseph passed away in Egypt on his 110th birthday. It was the first of his brothers to die. But he transmitted to them the divine promise to Jacob that his children would be taken out of Egypt and restored to their homeland their eternal homeland and made them a promise to take his remains with them when they did go. So look at the heart of Joseph here and how he still honoured his father to settle not only the siblings but the future generations back in the homeland, the eternal homeland. Did Joseph's pineal spiritual insight cause favor and dissension at the same time as much as it did his dad, Jacob? Maybe, maybe was that because he was the favored son, because Jacob saw something in his son that he saw in himself when he wrestled with God? Only the Lord knows. But in the midweek message that we've just shared, which was the kingdom dynamic, speaking of the biblical women, and having gone through account of just Leah and Rachel, we're not going to touch on the maidservants today, who bore the rest of the 12 tribes of Israel, realizing that Jacob had his children from four different women. I want to speak to those biblical women and courageous men out there. Because these um, accounts, historically, speaks of that generation gap of the times of the Israelites and still to today when our loved ones generationally the one above or the ones below 
are we taking the scriptural accounts and realizing that we're standing in the gap on behalf of generations here? That we may enter into the promised land in 11 days apart, as opposed to 38 years. The original plan was to go like this. On the 15th of Nisan, 1313 BCE, the people of Israel were taken out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses. In several weeks of preparation and self-refinement, they received the Torah, their mandate from God as his nation of priests and holy people, even at Mount Sinai, all the way back then. But I want to go into something here that talks about that journey from Mount Sinai, that 11-day journey, to the land of Canaan, the land of promise, the land of promise that was given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the covenant, the oath and the statute, the everlasting one, the eternal one, and the eternal homeland. The blueprint implemented by the people of Israel for life was contained in the Torah. It was the instructions of life that established the model society which serves as the key cornerstone of a harmonious and world community embodying the goodness and the perfection of their creator, God Almighty, El Shaddai. At that time, they only knew him as El Shaddai. Later, he revealed himself as Yahweh. Now, we can take the accounts and we can look at it and say, yeah, I read it, but I don't believe. Or we can look at the accounts of history and see how impactful it was for the children of Israel to wander in the desert for 38 plus years before they entered into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Thanks for Moses' uh, burning bush experience. And how we, Joshua is raising the next generation. I was just praying and worshipping this morning and saying, even a no for our generation can turn to a yes, which changes the destiny of future generations, even those yet to be born. I want to speak of Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spite the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel, from each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader amongst them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran according to the commandment of the Lord, all of their men who were heads of the children of Israel. Now before you think to yourself, well that doesn't apply to me because I'm not part of the twelve tribes of Israel, we look at God's family that started all the way back in Adam and Eve and how that spread right throughout generations in history until today. We look at our families, generational. And we could take this account and just realize maybe we could be one of the 12 tribes of Israel's through the inheritance and appreciation of even the Davidic line. Or even just being grafted back into Back into the olive tree. Well, the olive tree being grafted back into the vine. But I want to go into something here because there was a, a resistance of popular opinion that was spoken of in Numbers chapter 13 all the way through to chapter 14. You know, Joshua was continually, uh, continually faced with choices. And most of his decisions went against the popular opinion. Yet in each instance, he called on the people to increase their faith in God's promises rather than look at the impossible circumstances. The leader does not condition his appeal to the sentiment or mood of the times, but spiritual advancement requires faith, and unbelief will never see beyond the difficulties. Unbelief sees the walled cities and giants rather than the presence and the power of God. Unbelief looks at the obstacles, but faith looks to God. And Joshua and Caleb were willing to do the unpopular thing and call the people to positive faith. They led the way into the future by confronting the negative report and helping the new generations rise 
to serve God in faith. You know that the heads of the children of Israel shows why the report of ten carried such weight. Because they were key leaders. The key leaders who said, no, we can't take the promised land. But praise to the Lord for his mercies endure forever. And then it goes on a little bit later on in Numbers chapter 13 to talk about the 12 tribes of Israel. Reuben, Simeon, Judah, Issachar, Ephraim, Benjamin, Zebulun, Joseph, Dan, Asher, Naphtali, and Gad. These are the names of the men whom Moses sent out to spy the land, and Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Then Moses sent them to spy the land of Canaan, and said to them, Go up this way, into the south, and go up to the mountains, and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many. Whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or stronghold, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and they spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt, and they came to the valley of Eshkol. And they cut down the branch with one cluster of grapes, and they carried it between the two of them on a pole, because they were so big. They also bought, they also bought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back the word to them and to all of the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then when they told them and said, We went to the land where you sent us. Truly it flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are very strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and Hittites and Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. To be able is a word wealth, strong as accordance, 3201. Yakol is the Hebrew word. To be able, to have power, having the capacity to prevail or succeed. This verb is used 200 times in the Old Testament. And generally, it is translated by such English words as can could, or be able, or even to prevail, or even maybe to have power, to overcome. Remember in Esther chapter 8 verses 6, how it was translated as to endure? The compassionate queen asks, how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? But here in Numbers chapter 13, Caleb uses the intensive repetition of Yaakov, let us go up, for we are able to overcome it. So praise us to the Lord, for his mercies endures forever. Let's have a look at that historical account of being able to go into the promised land. But even back in the day, Moses was preparing them. He was preparing their hearts. He was preparing their minds and preparing their spirits to be able to say yes. And not know before they even went into the land of Israel to go and have a look and gather the grapes. Hmm. 
So looking at these historical accounts, and how we have the opportunity to change generations going forward, both men and women, male and female, mothers and fathers, standing on the shoulders of giants that were conquered in the land when they went over and took possession. Do we have the strength? Do we have the heart knowledge of being able to overcome difficulties? Sometimes sharing the current situation doesn't necessarily mean that our identity lies in that. But it just means that we're going to say, we're going to trust you, Lord. We're going to trust you for what only you can do. And go into the land. And bring back the fruit. But can we come back with the reverse of what happened historically? With the ten maybe saying yes and the two no. Or maybe even twelve saying yes. Remember Joshua and Caleb, the only ones that actually entered into the promised land out of that generation of those 12 tribes of Israel? What does it say about a second chance? We hold out and do a new thing. But we've got to get our hearts, our minds and our spirits prepared. And that's why it's important that we get the teachings of this uh, word of truth, word of life, so that we may be able to believe that all things in Christ is possible. I'm taking a lot of Old Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture here, because it's the foundational truths where Christ was hidden in the Old and God was with them right from the beginning to give them the promise that was available to them and not allowing the negative report to cause the same wilderness journey for 38 years in the current life that we live. Baruch Haba. I just want to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It speaks of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir and how they were defeated. How can we give our lives to the Lord that will allow us to gain that victory? By sending out that spiritual song going before us that will allow us to go into the promised land and claim the inheritance that will allow us to walk in that victory that he wants to give every single one of us. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? And then a little later on, it uh, says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of uh, Zechariah, and the son of uh, Benaiah, and the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah and the Levite, the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and your inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And then in verses 17, it says, You will not need to fight in this battle. But position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Then the Lord, then Jehoshaphat bowed his head, with his face to the ground, for praise. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, and worshipped the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of uh, Kohathites and the children of the Koratites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices of loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. 
a word wealth, Strong's Accordance 539, believe. To be firm, stable, established, and also to be firmly persuaded to believe solidly. In its uh, causative form, aman means to believe, that is, to consider trustworthy. And this is the word used in Genesis chapter 15, verses 6, when Abraham believed in the Lord. But here in 2 Chronicles, a man appears three times in one verse and could be translated to be established in the Lord and to be established you will be. From Amman comes Emunah, which is faith. The most famous derivative is Amen, which conveys the idea it is solid, solidly, firmly and surely true to be verified and established. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah. And they were defeated, for the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. This verse highlights the final key in Judah's miraculous uh, deliverance, which is praise, which <laughs> is the meaning of Judah. But as they began to sing and praise God with the expectancy that he would fight for them, their enemies were defeated. Now, whenever and wherever God's people praise him, he reigns amongst them and does miraculous things on their behalf. I look back in history and how we've journeyed in our own lives. We look at it from a personal point of view, but not pointing in, it's reflecting in so that we can see what God is doing and saying about the situations that we find ourselves in. And just a little under a year ago, I was contending for faith, contending for breakthrough, contending for that inheritance, physical and eternal. Because like David, a man after God's own heart, as well as Joshua, knowing the importance of the task that was given, not only for the past generations, and breaking the cycle of iniquity, and bringing the blessings to a thousand generations, made me realize something. Without God, we can't, and without us, He won't. And everything that we do in our own efforts, without praise and worship, leads us a little bit short into our own efforts and endeavours. But when we trust in the one true living God and ask Him to do what we can't do, that's perhaps maybe where He can step in and just say, I've got this. Turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to the fathers. But it's not just about the fathers, it's about the mothers and the fathers, the men and the women, but more importantly, God's children, both young and old. But when we have this praise and this presence of God that brings the victory, we can appreciate that we are battling things from an eternal spiritual realm that's always seeking things from God's point of view. Standing in the gap of that generation that needs to come into relationship coming under the divine grace and presence of not the external rules and regulations of the Torah, but more of the inscribing of the heart that sets us into victory. Here is a great lesson on the power and the praise and the resulting presence of God. When its mortal enemies threatened Judah with annihilation, the people sought God in prayer with faith in his word. They were encouraged by the word of a prophet one of the sons of Asaph, a guild of musicians who were appointed to prophesy, but not to be afraid, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The Levites responded by praising God with strong voices, and the appointed singers began to sing and praise, 
which is that word, the Hebrew word, telia. The praise in which God is enthroned, which invites his ruling presence. Psalms chapter 22 verses 3 talks about this. But the results that we have through praise and worship are profound. God's presence confounds three enemy armies. Even some scholars saying that the ambush involved angelic action, while others suggesting dissension and fierce feuds broke out within the enemy ranks, turning them against one another. And in either case, or even both, the contention between praise to God and the defeat of the enemy is clear, as God brought total, total victory. What does it say about our generations? What does it say about the yes or the no? What does it say about being able to take the inheritance that's there for us if we say yes? What does it say about our future generations and the blessings for a thousand generations for those who love God? We know that God works all things for the good for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. passage of scripture taken from the New Testament is something very profound because it gives us a glimpse of what God is doing in and through each and every single life, through his chosen vessels, his spiritual house. Sometimes we don't see things in the way that God sees them. Sometimes we take those steps of faith that we just ask God to open up the way where there seems no way. But it's through the word of God that brings about the prophecy Remember, we spoke of in the first message in 1 Corinthians. In David's song of thanksgiving. He permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. We can learn how to activate that prophetic call on our lives and allow the exercise of that teaching and God's anointing, because remember, he's the one that anoints um, the words that are prophetic utterances. And just as much as it is important to learn how to sing a new song and learn how to play that instrument and the worship and the songs and all the things that goes with it, it's just as important for the fivefold ministries to be established. But it's the appreciation of the mystery that includes all his family, all his children. There's a fullness here that I want to go into that's available and an invite. And it's spoken of in Ephesians chapter 3, which was talking about the eternal purposes. And Paul cites God in tent to display the church before all evil powers as his instrument to dispense throughout the earth as he has already accomplished through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, through his death, through his resurrection and the ascension. But there's a second apostolic prayer that was spoken of here for the Holy Spirit's power to fill every single believer, which is the logical need if the grand objective is to be realized. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations. There's a fullness here. 
there's a fullness that allows us to step into saying yes, number one, to our Lord Jesus Christ by coming into that place of surrender and also obedience, like they did on the other side of the Jordan, just about crossing over, or coming into baptism. I call it the third baptism. After the first one was through the Red Sea and the second one was over the Jordan River, the third one where Jesus was actually baptized. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a fourth, <laughs> Elijah. But I want to speak of the fullness here. It's a full member, a full complement, full measure. Copis uh, copiousness, plentitude, that which has been completed. The word describes a ship with a full cargo and a crew and a town with no empty houses. And Pleroma strongly emphasizes the fullness and the completion. We take steps of faith. We check in with our brothers and sisters. Because it's all about bringing the people into his presence, bringing them into a place of worship, bringing them into his divine nature, his character and his will. Because the day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And when we pray that for our generations, both young and old, it gives an opportunity for the manifest presence of Christ to be displayed. You know, the reformers like Calvin called Christian gatherings quorum deo, in the presence of God. And during the Great Awakenings, the Puritans spoke of the revival as the manifest presence of Christ. The prayer for revival is the invitation to this. To something wonderfully beyond God's essential presence. That is, He's always with us. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And also beyond His cultivated presence. That is, the believer who grows and knows and walks with God daily. The Apostle Paul prayed for believers to know that order of reformation or revival that brings about an intensification and in the presence of power of Jesus Christ comes through prayer. But this text's prayer, Paul asked the Holy Spirit deepening his work in the lives in each and every single one of the believers in three ways. That Christ would dwell more literally, be at home in the hearts of by faith, that is, that he would move from being an acquaintance to being the center of the church family. Number two, that they would grasp God's love at a spiritual level beyond intellectual or theological knowledge. And that three, that they would be filled with God's fullness. And that is, that the Holy Spirit will reveal the things of Christ more fully to them. Achieving God's fuller work in each life, unhindered, unquenched, and ungrieved. So when we appreciate this fullness and gives us the opportunity to know the way, the truth, and the life and come into a place of divine worship, entering into worship, learning the message, gaining the experience, but not head knowledge, but heart knowledge, taking the heart of tablets, putting them into the heart of stone, taking, taking what was once broken and restoring it to life. For generations. Baruch Abba. Just under a year ago, I took that step of faith in the physical. Maybe not realizing that we needed to approach it from the eternal. Not by our own doing, but by us trusting in God. For his provision, his breakthrough. No one comes to the Father except through me. But it's the Father who draws them unto himself. And it's just a beautiful mystery that we are still working out. I mentioned Baruch Abba quite a few times during this two part message. It's a generational inheritance that's an invite to anybody who wants to say yes. We're stepping into the promised land, taking the inheritance that's available, learning the accounts of history, taking the appreciation of the mystery, and also looking at um, the throne room of heaven gives us the eternal inheritance that we're seeking for, striving for. Standing in the gap, 
of the generations, maybe the lost generations, like the ten tribes of um, the lost ten tribes of Israel, or perhaps maybe even the grain that might be in that place of famine. Taking the accounts of the twelve tribes of Israel, Joseph's account of how he loved his siblings so much in the family that he was even finding a place for them in the eternal homeland. So here's the invite. If you want to take a step of faith and just say yes to putting your name down and uh, leading your family like the 12 tribes of Israel when they went in to spy the land, are you going to say yes or are you going to say no? Do you want to go see if the Holy Land is there for the eternal inheritance that promised that was promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the covenant, the oath and the, the statutes. If you do, then get in touch with a, an elder, a leader and say, Baruch Abba, blessed is the man or blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And let's take that journey into the promised land. Let's take that journey towards the spiritual and eternal inheritance, realizing that wrestling sometimes leads to the breakthrough. And also how we can pass it on to generations. Learning the lessons from old. And how we can restore. Even as Joseph looked after his siblings and family. And how the 12 tribes of Israel came together back then and still does today. And how God keeps a watch over the apple of his eye. Because the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So let's stand in the gap of the generations that haven't yet said yes to come into relationship and may have the negative report. Prayer and intercession is powerful. And if we can pray and intercede, not only in standing in the gap of our own families, but also our communities and our nation, allowing us to realize that the lessons of history, even currently, as shared with a message about the biblical woman on Wednesday, and how we need to hear what God is saying about the case in our lives. Because he's redemptive and he's personal. He wants us to come back into that covenantal relational love. Let's just go back to that Old Testament tablets and how important the impact of future generations through our decisions can be. There's a great possibility for grandparents, great-parents, uh, great-grandparents and even parents and their presence, their own presence through the transformed heart can have an impact and an influence on his or her offspring. There's a warning that the spiritual impact of decisions made or actions taken does transmit to successive generations according to God's word. There are spiritual genetics as well as the physiological ones just as Adamson transmits to the present and hereditary as well as a legal way, because we are all born with a disposition to sin. Not only with the fact that sin casts its shadow of us as human beings. So while no child is held responsible for the sins of his forebearers, he or she may inherit the propensity to bondage, the power of which perpetuates its evil impact on the offspring, even if they never met. Apart from repentance and consequent deliverance through Jesus Christ, any believer may be a carrier as it were, transmitting to future generations spiritual genetics of the past, but the opposite can take effect in Christ. Blessings to future generations are assured for those who love God and keep his commandments. And no earlier generation's influence is ever a fatalistic predeterminant of the present, where God's power and grace are invoked, but showing mercy to a thousand, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Do you say yes? Will you enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise? Will you take what's written in the word of life to transform our hearts, our minds and our spirits through Father, Abba, Ben, Son, Ruach, Holy Spirit? This is an, an eternal message and I plead with you. Because it's all about the throne room of heaven.
The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We're ending off this two-part message of standing in the gap with worship for the generations and the grain, for current and future generations. Worship is a strong accordance, four, three, five, two, from pros, which is toward, and kuneo, which is to kiss. To prostrate oneself, bow down, do obedience, show reverence, and do homage. Worship and also adore. In the New Testament, the word especially denotes homage rendered to God and the ascended Christ Jesus. All believers have a one-dimensional worship to the only Lord and Savior. We do not worship angels, saints, shrines, relics, or even religious personages. Because God is a redemptive God and is a personal God. Baruch Haba. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father God, I just thank you for the second part of this message, Lord. And as we stand on your truths, your eternal truths, the rock of our salvation, with faith, hope, and love, we thank you for bringing us into the family of God. We thank you for what you are doing in each and every single one of our lives, including our families. And thank you for allowing us the privilege and opportunity to stand in the gap on behalf of our own families, our communities, and even our nation, to turn our hearts back to you and say, Lord, do a new thing in our hearts, in our minds, and in our spirits. And Lord, as it says in your word, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We ask that this nation in South Africa be, South Africa be returned to their first love, and giving their hearts, their minds, and their spirits back to you by entering into the promises that you gave all the way back in the wilderness. Father God, I, we just thank you for what you are doing in and through every single person's heart and drawing them back to you. And as we stand in the gap, we say, Lord, we need you. And as the prophets were protected and you protected your prophets and also your children, not just the prophets, we ask that we worship you in spirit and truth and learn to sing a new song as we go into our eternal inheritance, the promised land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pray that this message will bring much blessings, not only to you, but to your children and your children's children for a thousand generations. Standing in the gap through worship and praise, even in the grain. Sending much love.